Let me tell you what, man. This episode of Fireside, you're going to need to clean up on aisle five after this one, man. episode of Fireside. It's been a pretty crazy time here at the uh, the Quill household over here. The weather's getting warm. You know, starting to be all uh, cheerful with spring and everything. And the summer's coming along too. I've had some AP tests this past week, so it's a bit stressful. And uh, you can tell the beard is gone. I shaved it for Mother's Day last, well the weekend before last, so tell times are changing here at the cool household don't you think bro let me tell you what man that was a pretty good beard i'll never have it back man that baby's gone since this is a taylor tuesday edition of fireside i'm going to be taking a look at an important aspect of zachary taylor's life photography just like social media is a new innovation that has taken our world by storm Photography had a special premium in antebellum American society, especially as Zachary Taylor became a household name in the United States. Capturing an image as it really was was a powerful realization that transformed a lot of aspects of daily life and the preservation of history as we understand it today. I'm going to bring you through a short history of photography, its influence in the Mexican-American War, Zachary Taylor's interactions with it, and an item I came across, which might be added to Taylor's photographical portfolio. Stay tuned for that, that's pretty exciting. Let's kick things off then. Why don't you join me in my library so we can delve right into this information. The art of photography has been perfected over the centuries and has come a long way from its humble origins. While a lot of scientists experimented with this art form in the 18th century, the first certified photograph that remains today was taken in either 1826 or 1827 by Joseph uh, Niepce. Niepce. In the 1830s, the daguerreotype process was created in France, where a silver-coated copper plate was exposed to create an extremely accurate depiction of the subject. It was a very tedious process. The exposure time ran upwards of 15 minutes, making it hard to sit and get an even picture. In the early days of the daguerreotype, very few could afford sitting for one. But as time progressed, the daguerreotype became a staple in American culture, proven by the 70 studios that popped up in New York City alone by 1850. The capabilities of the new technology were pushed to see how and where it could be used. The first ever light picture, or profile photo of a person, was taken by Philadelphia's Robert Cornelius in 1839. With the distinction of capturing the first photographs in the United States, Cornelius became an early pioneer of the technology. As time went on, photographers recreated the likenesses of different city scenes and prominent members of society, including presidents of the United States. But as a war with Mexico broke out in 1846, a new avenue for photography to enter formed. Wartime photography. American photographers began setting up shop in different towns in Mexico throughout the struggle, settling in Matamoros, Veracruz, Mexico City, and many others. A lot of the photographs that were created were usually of officers and Mexican citizens, capturing the cultural dynamics of the situation in Mexico. But there were some photographers that were able to point their lens at some of the broader movements of the war. Today, historians are able to examine a select few photographs of American troops in and around Saltillo, taken around 1847, held in the Banneke Collection at Yale University. Twelve daguerreotypes show American military units on patrol in the foreign land, bringing the reality of these troops occupying northern Mexico and awaiting 
a negotiated peace between the two nations. For instance, one daguerreotype shows General John E. Wool, Taylor's second in command at the historic and epic Battle of Buena Vista, traveling through the streets of Saltillo. Supposedly, the group of officers surrounding him was in essence his security detail. Wool would apparently travel with 20 dragoons with sabers drawn whenever he would patrol the dusty town. Compared to Taylor, who would only have one or two aides by his side on these visits, Wool was a little more cautious when it came to self-preservation, and historians have the visual to see it. Photography, though, had its limits. First of all, the terrain, which was usually sandy and uneven, was not suited for the camera apparatus for early photography during the Mexican War. The time for exposure limited any ability for a photographer to safely and accurately depict the scene of a battle. Photographers had a hard time acquiring materials for their work due to the American blockading of the Mexican coastline. Going back to what we already discussed earlier, daguerreotyping was a delicate process. It's plausible that many photographs that would have garnered real interest by historians today might have been shattered or misplaced over the years. Photographers were unable to come up with an effective strategy for the distribution of daguerreotypes from the war front to the public. Portraits and lithographs were more celebrated during the Mexican War because of the artistic flair and easy access for American citizens, painting a picture of the conflict favorable to citizens back at home. Over a decade later, the Civil War afforded photography the national audience and necessary improvements to make a real impact on Americans fighting the bloody war. But in the Mexican-American War, photographs stand today as more of a historical marvel than they did a tool for societal exposure back then. So how was Zachary Taylor tied into all of this? Well, considering Zachary Taylor didn't keep a daily journal of his exploits, it has been hard to officially pin down his personal relationship with photography much less any portion of technology in his lifetime. However, we do know that there were numerous times when Taylor willingly and knowingly sat down to have daguerreotypes taken of his likeness. If Taylor knew about Robert Cornelius' experiments when he passed through Philadelphia in 1840, there's no historical information that backs it. But Mexican war fame made the old general's daguerrean profile a coveted possession. Today, there are around 13 photographs of Taylor's that you can find some way or another on the internet. A great majority of them have no date and no photographer prescribed to it, and does anyone's guess exactly when all of them were taken? Five of these, we know, were taken during his presidency, presumably all in Washington, D.C., and by the famed photographer Matthew Brady. There are actually some pretty cool aspects to some of these daguerreotypes. Arguably the most famous Zachary Taylor photograph was taken by James McGuire, a photographer based out of New Orleans. This particular photo was captured on Taylor's return trip from Mexico in December of 1847, and was regarded by observers as the best and most striking likeness of old Zach we have yet seen of him anywhere. Another photo of interest is this one where Taylor is seated next to Colonel William W. S. Bliss. Bliss was Taylor's aide ever since the early 1840s, and took on an important role in securing the American victory in Mexico through his literary skills and tactical suggestions. Here the man the Taylor family called Perfect Bliss posed with the general. Soon after this photograph was taken, Bliss married Taylor's daughter Betty, who had become her father's hostess in the White House. This next photograph is actually of Zachary Taylor's cabinet. Shown from left to right is Secretary of the Navy William Ballard Preston, Secretary of the Interior Thomas Ewing, Secretary of State John Clayton, President Taylor, Secretary of the Treasury William Meredith, Secretary of War George Crawford, Postmaster General Jacob Collimer, and Attorney General Reverdy Johnson. Interestingly enough, Taylor was not the first president to have his cabinet photographed. His predecessor, James K. Polk, did so in the White House in 1846. But in my opinion, the most interesting Zachary Taylor photograph is one that I've never seen before. 
I know what it looks like, but the physical negative may be lost to the winds of time. Let me put it up on the screen. Here we see a depiction of General Zachary Taylor in the flesh, a lithograph by Charles Rizzo. It was supposedly left on the desk of a reporter from the New Orleans Daily Delta newspaper, and its contents are very intriguing to me. I always loved this picture, because in many of the depictions of Taylor sent back home from the Mexican War, he was presented as a very heroic figure physically. In some lithographs, General Taylor was dressed up in a very professional manner, with plumes and fancy uniforms, a stoic figure looking born to command. But in reality, Taylor was not anything close to that on the battlefield. He wore civilian clothing and appeared less than regal on a horse. Rizzo's lithograph is titled, Rough and Ready as He Is. And its realistic look at Taylor makes it a personal favorite of mine. Here, though, is something I didn't see until I looked into the picture a little more. Down at the bottom of the picture is a description of it. It says, Fast simile of General Zachary Taylor from a daguerreotype full-length likeness taken at Buena Vista by J. H. William Smith. There were a lot of questions that came to my mind when I read that. First, where in the world is this daguerreotype? None of Taylor's photographs that have survived today show him in action, on the battlefield. And now, there's a possible photograph that was taken at Buena Vista, the battle which brought him fame and glory and cemented him in the annals of American history? Finding the daguerreotype that Rizzo based his drawing off of would be an exciting addition to the history of the Mexican War and Zachary Taylor himself. Unfortunately, we may never find that photo, no matter how hard we look. Perhaps Rizzo was the last to see it before it disappeared. Maybe it still exists today, locked away in a storage unit or in an attic. Thank goodness we still have this drawing, though, as it is subjectively the most realistic depiction of General Taylor under fire. That is, until I came across something as I was surfing the web the other day. Let's return to that Banneke collection, where those 12 daguerreotypes from the Mexican-American War are located. One of those shows Major Lucian Webster's battery in a town just north of Buena Vista, probably Saltillo. Webster's men proved critical in protecting the town of Saltillo from the advances of General Mignon of Mexico during that February 1847 battle, and were in contact multiple times throughout the battle with Zachary Taylor to shore up the defenses. In this photograph, Webster's men don't seem to be in the midst of military action. It seems more like they're hanging out around the streets without much to do. To the casual observer, this photograph could be easily overlooked. However, this man on the rooftop with the sombrero caught my eye. I'd been searching for the source of that lost daguerreotype for a while. And maybe, just maybe, this image and this man with the sombrero could be the missing link. Maybe this was in fact a newly discovered profile of General Zachary Taylor. Now there are many reasons why it couldn't be Zachary Taylor. If it was Zachary Taylor in the flesh, for instance, why wouldn't the photograph have any mark telling that it was the commanding general of the entire American army posing in that picture as well? In addition, lack of a distinct date and location of when and where this picture was taken leaves a lot of unknowns to be answered. And clearly, everyone is entitled to wearing a straw hat without being mistaken for the eventual 12th President of the United States. It could just be another American soldier who emulated his superior officer, or a town citizen looking to get in on a moment in history. Maybe I'm just a crazed maniac to even think that there's any historical merit in this discovery. And, and you might have a point there, yeah. Um, yeah, so. My rebuttal to that argument, though, 
Is why would, in a picture where virtually all the subjects were soldiers dressed in their finest uniforms, be coupled alongside this dude who clearly didn't dress for the occasion? Only Zachary Taylor's individuality and sloppiness of dress could answer that question. And this picture was taken around 1847, either soon after the Battle of Buena Vista or when Taylor could have patrolled the area before leaving Mexico that November. That outfit looks to me to be pretty similar to the one that Taylor wore in that depiction that I was so intrigued by. Our mystery man has the hat, the bow tie, the civilian clothes, and quite possibly the tan that Zachary Taylor sported during his days in Mexico. Perhaps our old pal J.H. William Smith snapped the shot and subsequently had Taylor pose for the mythical lost photo. In the end, there's no real way of knowing if this photograph features General Taylor. Many different pieces of evidence would have to be looked at to justify that claim. But the biggest thing I took away from this process of researching for this episode of Fireside was that photography brings us into a time capsule of history in a way that no other medium can. And looking at these photographs for hours made me realize something about myself. I may need some serious help. Please help me. That is it for this 11th episode of Fireside. I really hope you enjoyed this deep dive into the origins of photography and how it had an impact on Zachary Taylor's life and historical value. Please like this video, subscribe to our channel, and share our content with your friends. Last time I checked, we are at 110 subscribers, and we really appreciate your support. Make sure to also check out our website, www.thezacharytaylorproject.com, to learn more about Zachary Taylor and our mission. There are cool activities on there for kids and some links to learn more about our 12th president. I'll make sure to include the links to the information I used in researching for this video down below in the description. Thank you for watching Fireside, and I'll see you next time. As time went on, nope. <laughs>